All right, Taylor, I think we jump into it. Let's sure. get it on the road. Cool. So everybody, today's agenda, we're going to discuss what are the proposed granny flat rules. Now, I absolutely hate that word granny flat. We're going to, I'm going to say prefabricated housing, but this is the term the government is using. This is topical in the media at the moment. So we have mimics the topical language. We're going to discuss what is an ear home Williams Corporation's prefabricated housing solution. We're going to discuss how you can fit it on your site and what systems and processes we have around that. We're going to discuss the cost or the investment of purchasing this product and the different solutions we provide. We have a special offer for you today to help you with your purchasing journey, followed by a Q&A session. So this is going to be 35 minutes, short, sharp, full of energy. Now, before we begin, this is my CV in 30 seconds. I'm a huge believer that you should validate your source of information. So my name is Matthew Horncastle. I'm one of Williams Corporation's directors. I come from a property family. Everyone in my family is in construction, mother, father, aunties, uncles, granddads, cousins, the whole shabam. I'm a qualified builder, so I've served my time in this industry from the ground up. I've owned a business since 2011, so I have a reasonable business tenure by now. I'm a thought leader in the New Zealand business space. I live in and invest in Williams Corporation properties, but my largest claim to fame is I'm the co-founder of Williams Corporation, which is one of the largest privately owned builders in New Zealand. Now, every great presentation needs to start with a legal disclaimer. So the legal disclaimer for today's presentation is we're not financial advisors. The information we are giving you isn't individualized financial advice. We do everything we can to make sure what we show you is true and is accurate. But please make sure you do your own research and seek your own advice before making an investment decision. A little bit about Williams Corporation. Williams Corporation is a residential property developer. We focus on infill housing, affordable to buy, affordable to live in, affordable to maintain, where you can live, work, and play. The way to visualize Williams Corporation, we're like a Hilux or a Tesla or a property. So we're not the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. We sit as an upper middle offering with a real focus on quality. Uh, we've built over 2,000 homes, that number is actually more like 2,100, and we've delivered circa $1.2 billion worth of real estate to our customers. Now, this is really interesting. I was just, I, I actually only threw this in about 10 minutes ago. I want to discuss a little bit of macroeconomics from, with you, and I want to get engagement from you, the audience, early on. So what you're looking at is called the property clock, and this is about the mood of the property market. So it's a very, very simple tool. 12 o'clock represents the peak of the market. So 12 till three, the market's declining. Three till six, the market's bottoming out. Um, six till nine, the market's rising. And nine till 12, the market's booming. So really, really interesting mechanism. There are no wrong answers. And what we'd love to do is just do a quick survey to see how you feel about the property market. So again, no wrong answers. We just want to know how you feel. Uh, yeah, so jump on in. Uh, you, so you can essentially select a number between one till 12. So just a reminder, 12 is the top of the market. Six is the bottom of the market. So seven would represent it just coming off the bottom and starting rising. Five would represent that it hasn't bottomed out yet. Six, bang on the bottom. I don't want to buy, I don't want to give you any bias um, in your vote. So it'd be really, really interesting to see what you're saying. We and then I'll sit in as well. So yeah. Okay. All right. Should we? Yeah. Three, two, one. There we go. And I'll see if I can share these as well. I'm not sure if you guys can see what well, I can see, but um, Matthew, can you see, you can see the results, right? I can't see the whole bottom. Do you want to just just scroll down yeah, a little? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Look, I mean, top line. It's kind of four. Oh no, I can. You can. So, the, so we've got a few. Five percent said four. Ten percent said five. Ten percent said six. Fifty-two percent said seven, and twenty-four percent said eight. So I've got really, really interesting data to report back to you. Now, I've been doing seminars all over New Zealand for a long time, and I ask this question all the time to get the mood of the nation. Two, uh, three weeks ago, I did a seminar in Christchurch, and pretty much everyone in Christchurch said seven. Uh, I did a seminar a week ago in Auckland, 
and pretty much everyone said five or six. And then I did one in Wellington and pretty much everyone said four or five. So essentially what, in my observation, Christchurch people think we're past the bottom, Auckland people think we're at the bottom, and Wellington people think we're just before the bottom, well, which makes sense because Wellington has some government redundancies and things like that, so I can understand that mood, and I can understand the mood of the nation feeling that we're past the bottom. So I would I would generally agree with those numbers, especially that seven. I think we're there, thereabouts. So now what I want to show you, can we click through? Yeah, fantastic. Now, what I want to show you is the New Zealand median house price. Now, I do a whole presentation on macroeconomics, but I love this chart. I um, mean, now in this chart, you can see the New Zealand median house price since the early 90s, uh, 1990s. And essentially, the first little bump you see right above the N in REINZ, that's the Asian financial crisis. So at the time, major economic event and the scheme of time almost inconsequential. Then above 2008, you can see the global financial crisis. Again, at the time, really large um, event that sort of hurt a lot of people. It was a very damaging time in the economy. But in the scheme of property transactions, almost inconsequential. Now, we come out the back of COVID, and we do have really interesting macroeconomic data. So the New Zealand median house price has increased, on average, just over 6% for the last 42 years. Now, what's interesting is out the back of COVID, we had two years with New Zealand median house price increasing at 15%. So you had this huge spike where we're moving at twice the long-term average, followed by a 15% correction and essentially a one and a half year plateau period. Now, if I'd actually updated this graph today, it's actually had another kick back up in the data. So the prices have jumped back up again, uh, which represents the mood of what everyone's saying, that we're past the bottom. And when you put a trend line on this graph, it's really interesting as well. As well. In my opinion, it shows that New Zealand property is actually undervalued. Uh, but yeah, really interesting data. And, and what the reason I show this graph after I show the property clock is we sort of bombarded with this property being really, really cyclical, this boom bust, but the actual data really just shows this gradual upwards march where properties increase over time. Over to you, Taylor. Thank you, Matthew. Hey, look, so guys, um, so I'll be uh, leading for the next uh, half hour or so. So look, my name's Taylor Green. So I'm the managing director of Air Home. So a bit about me. So I've founded, built, and sold a prefabricated home business in the past. Um, so I've got a really deep knowledge of the industry um, and I've helped over 100 people get into homes uh, similar to like this. So let's get into it. So the government proposes, sorry, the government proposes allowing granny flats to be built without resource or building consent. So this happened on June 17. So this is why we're here. So keep in mind, the caveat I will say, it is a proposal, but Chris Bishop and the other ministers are openly saying it's happening, celebrating it, putting these things up on social. So in their minds, it's happening. Once you read the proposal as many times as I had, you can. it's 99% there. It's just the final details they're going to work out. So I'm going to take you through what those, the 99% is. So what does this mean? So... <clears throat> Here's the kind of overarching uh, bullet head, right? So granny flats under 60 square meters won't require building or resource consent. So I'm going to dig into each of those points. So first step, what's a granny flat? It's going to pause here. I mean, I didn't think I'll be saying granny as much as I have in the last few months. Uh, last time was probably around the age of 10, but here we are, granny flats. We're going with it. So um, it's a minor residential unit, right? A minor dwelling. And so it needs to be ancillary to the primary dwelling. So quite a few few people have asked, can I just put three or four of these on my property with no building consent? No, the intent of this is for one minor dwelling per primary dwelling. So it needs to be detached, i.e. kind of standalone. You can't fix it to the existing house. Uh, single story, you can't put a three-story granny flat in your backyard. Uh, it needs to be under the same title. So the same owner, can't, so you can't subdivide it and sell it off. Um, and this exemption only applies to a new building. You can't retrospectively uh, do it to an existing building. So look, what are the current rules? So some areas allow granny flats if they comply with local zoning rules. Um, resource consent could be required if it doesn't meet those local zoning rules. And building consent is required for all new dwellings with plumbing. 
So you might be aware that there was a, a new rule that came out a few years ago, five, six years ago now, around um, any sleep outs um, under 30 square meters are exempt. So this standard, what they're going to introduce for the granny flats is the exact same standard. It'll be rolled out across the country with just kind of a blanket rule. So the same thing as the sleep out, um, the sleep out building consent exemption rule as well. And the second point is it won't require building or resource consent. So we're going to dig into this and what this means, right? So here are the conditions that must be met. So it needs to be built to building code. Okay, so building code covers the minimum standards for building work. So it ensures that buildings are dry, don't leak, durable, don't fall over. Um, that's, so that's kind of the, the key one, right? It needs to be built to building code. And the second part of this is it needs to be built um, and work needs to be carried out by licensed professionals. So it needs to be built or supervised by a licensed builder, an LBP. Uh, it needs to be connected to services by licensed plumbers, drain layers, and electricians. So what they want is this whole system will, will kind of self-certify in a way where we've got licensed professionals who stake their license on their own work, uh, connected in such a way where they all stand by their own work. So you build your granny flat, it's on your property, then what? So you need to have records of this new dwelling for insurance purposes, for lending, um, for property files, right? So the most likely option, which I've said is the most preferred option, is that once the work has been completed, uh, then you will notify the council. Uh, and that creates a record of build of this building on that property for banks and insurers, the council, things like that. So that's how you'll tell the council that it's there uh, and then you've gone through this process. So a question I've been getting quite a lot is around, can I still get bank finance? So uh, I had a chat to the head of pre-built loans from Westpac um, and here's what he has said. So from, as an example, so the, what they're saying is there is no change in the process and how they would deal with uh, lending on these homes. Uh, in their mind, they still use the land as security. Um, it's just a different way that it's going to get consent. So in their mind, there are no changes. What it would highlight is that to use a, a banking product like this, uh, the home does need to be permanently fixed to the land, i.e. to foundations. Uh, so not a tiny home on wheels, for example. Another question I get. So preempting a lot of these questions. Uh, can I rent out a, my granny flat? So yes, these can be rented out like any other minor dwelling, uh, which is great. So this opens up opportunities for property investors and likewise opens up opportunities for tenants as there's more places to rent and maybe at a lower cost as well. So it is really uh, advantageous for everyone that these uh, can be rented out. Okay, we're going to do our second poll of the night. How would you use a granny flat? So look, I'm going to launch this now. Uh, the intent of this is just to get a bit of an understanding of who I'm talking to tonight. So I will launch this. How would you use? There we go. Okay. So two options here, extra space for families. What that means is, are you going to use this for personal uses? So, um, you know, is this for your kids or your or your granny or extra income? What I mean by that is, are you going to use this for uh, maybe on a, an investment property you have as another, as another dwelling or Airbnb? Uh, so yeah, but great to just get a feel for who we're talking to tonight. Ah, interesting. So like it's it's 50-50. Yeah, cool, cool. Three, two, one. Look, it's actually <laughs> it's bang on 50-50. So that's interesting. That's good to know. So I'll try and cover uh both sides of this coin then. Okay, let's get out of that. <clears throat> okay. Um, all righty, so getting into a bit more of the detail now. Uh, so how do I know if I can fit a granny flat on my property? So there's two things that we're looking at here today. So um, one is setbacks, how far away from the boundary can it be? And the other one is site coverage. So I'll dig into each of those. So setbacks, what is the distance from the boundaries? Um, so for residential zones, so they do split this residential and rural. So for residential zones, um, what the proposal is suggesting is pretty much two options. From the road, it's either 1.5 to 2 meters, and from the side boundary, 1 to 1.5. For reference point, this is very similar to kind of medium density zoning rules. So good in the sense that they are making um, those restrictions less. In some uh, low density rules, uh, sorry, low density zones, for example, those setbacks might be 5 meters from the road and 3 meters from the boundary. So this is quite a great rule where it is allowing you to put these green flats in tighter spaces. For rural, they said there's two options, either zero meters from boundaries or 
eight for the road and three for side boundary. I don't think they're going to go for zero. So I think the most likely is three from side boundaries, eight from the road boundary. And the second part, uh, sorry, the second key part to look at when we're looking at um, does it fit on site is around the building coverage. So what that means is what percentage of the site is covered by the main dwelling plus the granny flat. So currently it's around 35 to 50% most zones. And so what they're suggesting is here's the three proposed options. So the, the minimum is going to be 50% and then the maximum is 70%. So, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd say they might land on 60%. But again, who knows? The fact that minimum is 50% is fantastic. Again, median density zoning is around 50%, um, sometimes less. So to just start off at 50% means that you can put these in more places where you couldn't before. So again, advantageous if you want to put granny flats in your backyard. Okay, so these rules will be finalized shortly. Um, so it's good to just, I suppose, take a step back. As I said, June 17, this was announced. Um, they closed the feedback in August. Uh, and then they said this year, we're going to finalize these last few details. So late 24, it's already late 2024. We've got about a month or so left but before I'm sure everyone goes on holiday. Um, and then they're saying the new rules are in play next year. So these will become a national environmental standard next year. Um, so we already have customers lined up to have these built. Um, have these homes built and put on their property first thing next year, knowing that this is coming. So we can, can kind of see it's coming. Yes, having these final details, that final stamp of approval will help. Um, but it's it's happening next year um, and it's all been kind of announced and planned for this all happening next year, which is very exciting. So look, another poll, again, just to get a bit of a feel for the room. So after knowing everything you know now, well, not everything, but knowing some things you know now, I'm curious, are you more likely to add a uh, granny flat than you were, say, 20 minutes ago? This could be a bit of a loaded question. If I get a lot of no's, then I'm, I'm clearly not doing uh, my job very well. Okay, look, it's it's pretty clear. It's it's ninety five percent yeses there, so I think I'll just <laughs> leave that. Uh, cool. All right, jumping forward. So look, so pretty clear. You can have a granny flat. It's becoming much easier. You don't need a building or resource consent. What's next? So if you are thinking about a granny flat, a minor dwelling, there's typically two ways to build this in your backyard. So one is a prefab build and one is an on-site build. So I'm just gonna tell you a quick story, two minute story about why I got into this industry in the first place. So many years ago, I wanted to add uh, some extra rental income to an investment property I have. Um, so the tenants didn't wanna have tradies in the backyard for a couple of months. So we waited for the tenancy to end before we started the work. Um, and so it's meant to be a six week build to, to add this sleep out. Uh, so picture this, it's Friday afternoon, I'm at work, um, the installation and cladding and lining are meant to be going on the week after. However, it's, it's weather warning of rain for the next five days. The builder's gone home and didn't wrap it with building, building wrap. So, so I go to Bunnings, I get some building wrap. Um, I'm up there on the roof in torrential rain in my work clothes, trying to wrap this thing, uh, to keep it watertight. Long story short, I was short of building wrap about three or about two square meters, this little hole up there. Um, so the whole exercise was redundant. It was, um, you know, incredible waste of, of my time and almost uh, really hurt myself. Um, but in the end, the, the project went way over the estimated budget as it wasn't a fixed price, as, as often the case with on-site builds. Um, because of the various weather delays, it went way over the time frame they gave us, uh, which meant we lost even more rental income waiting for this. So knowing what I know now, um, and part of the reason I started the business as I did, um, and seeing from firsthand experience how prefabricated homes are such a great solution, um, they're actually pretty underutilized in this country. So as an example, in, in Sweden, I think about 80% of all homes are built off-site in this way. So what are the advantages of prefab homes versus an on-site build? So number one, there's no traders in your backyard for months. So I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy getting woken up with a bandsaw at 7 a.m. Um, you know, with a prefab home, there's probably people in your backyard for about a few days to a week setting up foundations once the home's on site, then connecting services. So a few, about a week versus three to four months. Um, it's a fixed price. Um, this is one of the most common stories I hear, almost horror stories I hear really is from people who have had a contract for an on-site build or a quote, sorry, uh, that official quotes all agreed upon um, pre-build 
But by the time it got to the end of the build, that cost had gone over by 50, 80%, sometimes double. Um, so one of the biggest reasons people choose to buy a prefabricated home from us is that the security that the home itself is a fixed price. Uh, another big benefit is that once we agree on the project, uh, we do all the work in the background and then one day the home is delivered, 100% finished. Uh, so a couple of days of connecting to water, plumbing, electricity, uh, or building steps or a deck, and the home is 100% ready to be lived in. So that means you don't need to project manage the build yourself. No curly questions from builders while you're at work. Uh, we will do all of this for you. And then lastly, you can pick this up and move it in the future. These homes are transportable by, by nature. This is a question to get quite a lot. So yes, if you put it on your property now, five years, 10 years time, if you did want to pick it up and move it, you can do that. You just unfix it from the foundations, pick it up and move it. However, what I would say is that something which people overlook is that once you put this home on your property, it will significantly increase the value of that property by at least the value of the air home itself. So it is worth keeping that in mind that when you put this on your property, it is an investment in that property and the value will, will represent that. So let's dig into what is an air home. Uh, so it's a New Zealand's premium prefab home solution. So what does that mean? So look, before I go into what an air home is, I'm gonna start with what it is not. So this is not built on wheels. This is not a caravan. It's not built in someone's backyard on Trade Me. This is a dwelling built by professionals. Okay, so it's built in three locations across the country, Auckland, Palmerston North, and Christchurch. Uh, so we're one of the few prefab home builders with this sort of coverage uh, across the country. And it is built and completed off-site and then delivered 100% ready to be lived in. So this whole entire proposal, I suppose I'll just take a step back a little bit. I think this entire proposal will be positive for Kiwis. Um, however, I think with anything of this kind of blanket rule nature, that it will be 90% positive and 10% negative. And what I mean by that is that I, there will be a lot of cowboys building this in their backyards, kind of getting a little bit of that gold rush, you know. Um, but without the normal checks and balances in the form of council inspections, uh, they might use substandard materials, they might cut corners. And unfortunately, you Kiwis would never know. So... The hard thing is they probably won't be around for the next 10 years, let alone 10 dec decades to kind of honor their, their guarantees. So look, for us, it makes perfect sense for Williams Corporation to standardize this whole process and create a turnkey solution for the entire country. So we have the experience over 13 years of building homes. We have the building ex expertise. We've built over 2,000 homes, over a billion dollars worth of homes. Uh, we build high quality homes that we stand by. And we have the processes set up across the country to build 250 homes per year. So what is this built out of? So this isn't a container home. We don't use plastic freezer sit panels. This is built like any other home using high quality trusted building materials. Uh, so timber framing, insulation, double glazed joinery, either fiber cement cladding or color steel cladding, color steel roofs. So very, very long lasting durable materials. Uh, because it's a new build, it comes with the standard guarantees of all new builds, which is a 10 year structural and water site guarantee. So we provide the full, a full-size bathroom. So the bathroom and kitchens are the key areas not to sacrifice in space when designing a home. Um, and that's true whether we're talking about a townhouse down the road or one of our homes. Uh, our kitchens are the same ones we use in our large-scale developments. So they're high quality, they're spacious, and they're fully equipped. So our homes are currently designed by architects and will continue to be designed by architects, even though we won't have to put it through the building intent process. We have a team of architects on hand uh, that build our homes and will continue to design our homes. And look, these come with a lot of added extras. I think the next slide is going to show this. Um, so I'll run through it then. And they are ready to be lived in, as I've said. So uh, here is the list of chattels. So these added extras are almost worth um, about $10,000. So it comes with a Fisher & Paykel hob, a Fisher & Paykel dish drawer, Fisher & Paykel oven, uh, you know, a washer dryer unit, a heat pump, comes with TV cabinet, wardrobes, blinds. So they are very much ready to be 100% lived in. You or your tenant just needs to buy a bed and a couch, um, perhaps a bottle of wine to celebrate, and it's ready to be lived in. Um, so there are very few other builders that are, give the amount of value that we give in terms of um, what comes with the home. Um, and if you are renting out, they are all Healthy Homes compliant. Uh, it kind of goes without saying, but I will say it, they are all Healthy Homes compliant. So look, here are some photos of the studio show home uh, last year um, at one of our showgrounds in Christchurch, I believe. 
Uh, so here's just a good look of what you can see inside. So again, with highlighting, this is a studio. So yes, there is a bed in the middle of the uh, in the home here. So again, with the with the other um, uh, one and two bedrooms, the bedroom is obviously up to the side, but this is just to show you what it looks like in terms of the finish and colors and things like that. Uh, so like you can see down here, breakfast bar built in, which it is in most of our homes. You can see the cabinets, the TV, um, TV cabinet, the wardrobes. Again, the kitchens and bathrooms. So getting a dig into the range a little bit now. So as you can see here, there's six homes that we offer. So from studios um, all the way to three bedrooms. And you'll see here that our largest is 60 square meters. Uh, that's no coincidence. <laughs> So I'm just going to run through um, each of these and what they look like. So our studio is our entry level. So this is um, open plan living, which uh, look, long-term tenants might not like. However, this means it's great for Airbnb um, as, you know, if you are only staying for a few nights, uh, guests won't mind not having a standalone bedroom. Um, and why is that good for Airbnb? As a host, you can't look at a return on investment. So it's, as I said, good entry level, and you'll probably get the same nightly rate as you would from a one bedroom. Uh, so you can see here, open living, um, and we also have the option, this is the end deck option. We also have the option for the door to be on the side as well. Okay, so a one bedroom. So this is great for, for family members, for kids, or, or for grannies. Um, it's also good for a rental property as it's our entry level uh, one bedroom home. So when you get to long-term rental, there is going to be a rental um, a rental income difference between a studio and a one bedroom. So most people would always opt for the one bedroom. Uh, and this is the great entry level option to do that. So again, you can see here, um, so you've got uh, wardrobes and a desk nook, um, breakfast bar here. And again, with this, you could um, have the end deck option. So there's a slider here um, on that end as well. So it depends on your site, would help you work out which one is best. Okay, this is our more spacious one bedroom. So good for couples as a long-term home. So a bit more space instead of a breakfast bar, you've got room for a dining table, but again, very similar setup. And again, you can have this on the side, the, the main entrance on not instead of the end, you can have it on the side. Okay, this is our entry level two bedroom. Um, so what you can see here is that we have um, lots of lots of natural light here. So a slider of each of the bedrooms and the main living. Um, and what you can see here is this is um, one floor plan here and then below is an alternative floor plan whereby the kitchen and the bathroom have swapped around. Um, this is actually one, a request from our one of our latest sales in Cromwell uh, where she had the view going out to the mountains that she wanted to see through the kitchen. So that is the alternative floor plan for that one. So this is our two bedroom, 60 square meter. So this is kind of the Mac daddy. This is the, this is the batch. This is the really good Airbnb income. This is great for um, getting that extra rental income if you've got the space. Um, so this is really spacious. Uh, so we launched this, I think two weeks ago and we've already sold two. So this is going to be our most popular units. Um, it's pretty clear to see that now. So you can see here, a lot of space, Big kitchen island there, good space for living and two full size bedrooms. There's small pictures here. And these homes, all of them, you might have noticed that these homes, the, the colors are kind of swapping between the black and white mono pitch or this uh, black and timber gabled roof. Um, so again, there are obviously two color choices and two choices for mono pitch roof or gabled roof as well. And so this is our uh, three bedroom home, which we actually released last week. Um, so this actually come just from straight customer demand and people asking us over and over. So um, three bedroom, 60 square meter home. Uh, if you look at this floor plan, what we've done is we've taken the two bedroom floor plan. We've made the bedrooms bigger. So they are, um, they come out a bit further and you still have a full size lounge there. You still got the same kitchen and everything else. So um I mean, tell me where else you get a three bedroom home for this price. So from a rental point of view, incredible. If you do the, um, the RI numbers, the return on investment on a three bedroom for that price, it's pretty amazing. So again, this has come from uh, a lot of people asking us to do this. So pretty happy to see it in the market now. Okay, so this is just to recap what you went through. Um, and you can, again, once you kind of have seen them all, then get a feel for the pricing and whatnot. So I think the next poll is going to be which home size suits you most. So again, this is just quite helpful for us to see uh, what people are enjoying. So hopefully you can <clears throat> see that poll now. Oh, 
Okay, pretty even split. I'll just go five, four, two, one. Okay, I'm going to share this. So, look, much more even than I was expecting. Yes, the um, 60 square meter two bedroom is most popular, but by not as much as I thought. That's interesting to know. This is good market research. Okay. So now we're getting into the real um, uh, the real detail of it all. And this is probably why a lot of you are here. Um, it's working out how this actual process works. So with these new rules in mind, um, as part of this, these initial feasibility checks, our team of in-house experts, so architects and planners, we look at two main things now. So number one, is there enough space on site? And number two, is there appropriate access to deliver? The worst thing we could possibly do is build this thing and we can't actually deliver it. So those are the two main checks, as I'm sure you can appreciate we need to do. So here's an example of a project we're looking at in Christchurch. So we look at the home. Um, this is a great piece of software we have where we can take any address, overlay our homes on it, and you can see it gives us the exact setbacks from all the boundaries. So um, setbacks, one meter from all the side boundaries. Yep, big tick. There you go, that ticks. Um, and then two meters from the front boundary, um, same thing. And in terms of delivery, Look, we just drive um, into the driveway or into this front um, boom and a hive could just drop straight into the foundation. So for us, that's a big tick, tick. Um, and so look, for delivery, it's worth mentioning that even, even if your access isn't as accessible as this, uh, cranes are always an option. Uh, they do sound daunting, uh, but look, they are always a, a, an option and they are quite common in this industry as well. And look, what I thought I'd just do, um, these are the projects I've been working on the, uh, for the last kind of week or so, and I thought I'd just throw them on here just to show you the different kind of setups and um, layouts that you can have and how it all works. So look on the left, uh, this is a tenant, uh, sorry, uh, a landlord who wanted to add another uh, tenancy here. So you can see here, um, put on the front section again, and it's all facing outwards so that they wouldn't have to, um, it wouldn't be looking into the home. Uh, this one on the right was actually uh, Renee from Napier. I hope you don't mind me putting this on there. She contacted me about two hours ago and she's uh, watching tonight, I think. Said she was. And so again, you can see here, uh, this is for her home here. Um, and this is on the front. Again, you can see here, one meter from the side, two meters from the front. Uh, you can see how these things do all comply. Uh, this one down here, this person wanted to add another uh, tenancy income as well. So uh, the intent was to put it down here so the tenants um, and the main so this new tenant and the main tenant wouldn't um, have to interact. They can just kind of come on the driveway, park on the road, come to the driveway, access it on that way. Uh, this one here, this customer in Christchurch wanted to add this two bedroom home. Um, and you can see here, they'll um, be able to access from this road, put it over here. And you can see here, this, this backyard was not waste. Well, their words weren't necessarily wasted, but there's a huge amount of backyard that probably weren't working. With this new home here, this tenant can enjoy a huge amount of space back here and make it feel really private. And last one, this one was in uh, Auckland. So again, she wants to put this home here to um, sell her existing home or rent her existing home out. And she realized it would pay her much more to do that, pay to put this on here and she'll be making money. Uh, and this one here is in Christchurch. Uh, so again, you can see even with a few obstacles, we can even slip this in and it will still meet all the requirements. So digging into what the investment is. Um, so what we're going to go through as an example is start off with the studio um, and then it will kind of build out as we go. So just bear with me. So the studio, the home itself is 140000 To be really clear, that's GST inclusive. None of the numbers will show you be GST exclusive. I find that a bit uh, naughty that people ever do that. So yeah, all GST inclusive. And then you can start to see um, some average provisional costs. So what that means is kind of the, um, yeah, kind of an average of what we see across the board. So foundations for this size is about 6,000. Connecting to services, um, so plumbing, water, electricity, assuming that you have services there, assuming it doesn't need a new septic system and things like that. So this is kind of a, a basis on a kind of an average job that we would see. Um, delivery. So this delivery is obviously highly dependent on location. So this delivery number assumes a three hour drive away and it assumes um, you know, a higher dropping it onto foundations at the end. And then building stairs at the deck. So access to and from the, uh, the doors. 
So then if we build this out, um, you can start to see that, look, I wouldn't get too lost in these numbers here. I'll concentrate on these numbers at the bottom. So if your favorite you're looking at was a 60 square meter two bedroom, your total cost is approximately $245,000. So that's again, good for people out there who are just trying to get a gauge, a general gauge of how much these things cost. Again, this is not personalized advice. Please don't use this and, and say, this is exactly what you told me it was going to cost. Get in touch and based on your exact location, based on your site, I can help you pull together um, some more accurate provisional costs. And then what we're going to do, because there are some people here who are interested in the extra income side of things, is we're going to run through a little bit of a case study. So what we're going to do is work out how much money and how much return on investment you can make from one of our homes. So to keep things simple, we're going to use a studio as the example for this case study. Um, just to make it keep it really consistent. And it's, the studio is going to be placed in Christchurch. Again, I know these re these rental um these rental figures will change across the country, but again, for some consistent numbers, a studio in Christchurch is what we're going with. So here's an official rental appraisal for our 36 square meter studio in Christchurch. Um, so based on a long-term rental, you'd be looking at getting bringing in $23,000 per year. So then if you look at short-term accommodation, so Airbnb, booking.com, things like that, um, the average nightly rate is $125. Uh, with 85% occupancy, and that means the gross annual income will be over $38,000. So keep those two numbers in mind. We don't have to remember them, I'll tell you. So um, so we're looking at return on investment. So if we look at the ROI over the long-term rental income, the additional income of 23,000 over the total investment of 163,000 is a return on investment of 14%. So I know as an investor myself that anything over 5% is great. 10% is almost unheard of. But with our ear homes, you can get a 14% return on investment for a standard long-term rental. But then if we look at the ROI from short-term accommodation, so it's a whopping 23% return on investment. So yes, there will be some small fees depending on if you list through Airbnb or booking.com, but 23% as the gross income is incredible return on investment. So hopefully here you can see the very real potential of how air homes can make you some additional income. And look, well, it wouldn't be nice to have some extra income coming into your uh, bank account in this market. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, all right, so these homes are built to a really high quality. Uh, they're one of the few home builders that can deliver anywhere across the country. And they turn up 100% complete with a lot of added extras. What does the process look like? So the first step we offer is a free feasibility study. So what it would look like would be, um, I'll you give me your address. I would send you back some of those plans, which you saw before. I'll put together some provisional costs based on how far away from our, from our factories, the access, if we need a crane or a hire, things like that. So I'll pull together some, some pretty tight provisional costs. Uh, so from there, you get some provisional costs here. And if you are comfortable with that price and wanting to move forward, we sign a conditional contract. And that conditional contract says that, yes, I'm happy with these costs um, once we get them uh, fixed and firmed up. So once we have this conditional contract, um, this allows us to get our local subtrades in and give quotes for this project. Now, assuming those quotes come in within 10%, uh, the agreement goes bit ahead um, as you've said that you are comfortable with those costs and, they, and those costs have come in with what we kind of said they're going to be. If those costs, those quotes fall outside of our estimates by 10, of those 10% range, um, then you don't have to progress. Contract can fall over if you want it to, and you can pull out and say, hey, this is actually a bit more than I thought it was going to be. However, more often than not, customers will continue forward as that's just the cost of the project it's going to be. Um, so then we confirm the order, the build starts on our end, and then during that time, the on-site works take place. Then once the home is complete, the home is delivered, and then we have the teams um, connect the home to the services and finish everything up. So the total time for this process is about two to three months. So now I'm going to pass over to Matthew, who will explain um, the next kind of few steps. Fantastic presentation, as always, Taylor. Um, so I think it's very, very important to identify who we're not set up to service. So we're not set up to service large on-site builds. So if you want to build a big home, you're probably better to go to a housing company and have that built on site. 
we're not set up to service the person that values the cheapest possible option. Uh, there are providers in the marketplace that are cheaper than the product we provide, and we're happy to give you some recommendations if you wanted a cheaper option. Um, and someone that's looking for a caravan or something on wheels, I don't even know why that's there. Um, we're not a caravan manufacturer. These are prefabricated homes uh, built for a consumer that values quality. Um, who is it for? It's looking for someone that wants a studio, a one bedroom or a two bedroom up to 60 square meters, someone that values the quality of the asset um, and someone that wants a permanent long lasting dwelling where everything's done properly from a professional company. So what does the next 12 months look like? Uh, speaking as a property developer, speaking as Williams Corporation, we are seeing interest rates dropping. We are seeing inquiries increase. We are seeing land get more expensive. We're seeing contractors getting booked up. We are very, very realistically heading into a rising property market. So we are dealing with busy trades. We're dealing with price inflation within the construction sector. And we're dealing with lots of things throughout the process, whether that be construction, whether that be consenting, whether that be any part of the process taking longer. So what I would recommend you do, if you look at this and you say, wow, this is really cool. I've got some land. I think this is right for me. I would highly recommend booking a meeting with Taylor. He is absolutely fantastic at what he does. He has all the amazing software on the Williams Corporation side. Uh, we've got fantastic facilities to manufacture these. We are constantly going through our plans with a fine tooth comb getting a really great quality product for you, the consumer. Uh, our project managers are always down at the yard overseeing the manufacturing of these products being built. And there's a really great team of trades there building them. So I do recommend getting in touch and going through your personalized consult uh, to see if we can help you and to see if this product is right for you. Cool. So I'm just going to launch a poll now, guys. Let's just get a bit of a feel. Um... So say yes, please. We'll get in touch and we'll just do a free, no obligations. Uh, yeah. um, meeting we with can't you. guarantee that we can help everyone, uh, but it is definitely worth uh, us looking at your site and we can discuss with you like what size home we can fit on your property, uh, what that looks like, costing, et cetera. So essentially all you get from clicking yes, please, is we'll reach out with you. We'll reach out to you uh, and start that process to see if we can help you. Yeah. So we'll give them look, another few seconds. Yeah, another few seconds. And look, what I'd say is that um, kind of what Matthew alluded to before. So yes, this is happening next year, um, but I'd always, um, yes, our build time is, our process is two to three months, but I'd recommend speaking to to us, to me, sooner rather than later, right? Because let's say you talk to me this month and you say, yep, it's possible. You probably might need, need to go to a bank to get funding. They might ask a few questions. That whole bank funding finance part of things might take one to two months. And then all of a sudden, it's it's kind of uh, the, the timings just keep getting bumped out. So I'd always recommend talking to me sooner rather than later. Even if you think you might like this idea, you might not do it until next year. Let's just start talking now. Get the ball rolling so you can understand what those next steps might look like. So perfect. Thank you very much to everyone that clicked. Yes, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, let's jump into the next part, which is our Q&A. Is that correct? Yeah. So. Okay, so just a reminder, we're about to go through these questions. On the bottom right has the Q&A, and we're going to go through your questions as long as you want us. So starting with question number one, uh, do would they require a code of compliance certificate? Do you want to talk through that, Taylor, from a compliance side? And then we'll obviously say that Williams Corp does it all. Yeah, yeah. So um the answer is no. So uh, you're saying a code of compliance certificate, a CCC. So that normally comes when you go through the um, building consent process. Um, so we wouldn't do that because it doesn't go through the building consent process. Um, however, you would still get a, um, the electrician would still give you um, one and the plumber would still. Um, so while we wouldn't give you a yeah. official CCC. Yeah, essentially. So, so the code of compliance certificate is is a council process that comes at the end of the council building consent process. Uh, but what there will be is there'll be notification requirements. So essentially, we would need to notify the authority of what we're building on your site so they can update their property records. And then we essentially produce to you the equivalent of a code of compliance certificate. 
So it's all of the same information that we would use for a code of compliance. And we are giving this to you as the customer, as a professional builder, saying, here are all the products that we used. Here are all the people that built the home. Here are all your associated warranties from each individual involved. Here are the LBP details. And here is our details as the housing provider. So although it's not technically a code of compliance certificate because that is a council process, we, we would produce the same document because we're set up to produce that for every single home we build. Yeah, it's, it's worth highlighting. As you just said, it's funny, the process won't change how we build these things. We'll still build them the exact same way using the exact same people and architects and everything, but we just won't have council telling us what a great job you did. But we still build them the exact same way. There might be some people who don't, but we will just still follow the exact same process. So the next question, I'm going to just trial this answer live, by the way. Oh, no, that's just, okay. The next question is, what if you have a building line restriction? Uh, so I can answer this. Uh, so building line restrictions, we can definitely help you with that process. It's worth having a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Uh, as a property developer, I often get building line restrictions removed for development. Um, and this is a real benefit you, the consumer, get from dealing with a property developer we know all the different things, problems, dances. And so if the, the ear home team can't necessarily solve a problem or help you with something, they can jump in and use the talent and the people and the resources from the property development team. And we can go, oh, yep, we know how to get that removed. You've got to do this. You've got to do that form. Send it to legal, blah, blah, blah. So if you have a building line restriction, that doesn't mean you can't build on it. We have had them removed very often. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It is worth inquiring and we'll see if we can help you with that process. Right. Uh, Mike, so um, did I miss something? Did you say the minimum land has to be covered by the main house and the granny flat? So yeah, near Mike, I think I um, that was misinterpreted. So you don't need to cover, 50, you don't need to cover 50% of the land. That was the maximum of land you can cover it could be 50% or 70%. So if you have two acres, you don't need to have an acre full of uh, air home. And, and can I just, I just want to probably reiterate something. We are discussing the government's rule change for you to build this house without a building or resource consent. We can still do anything you want as our customer. If you own a beer block of land and you want to put 10 of these on, we can do the building consent. We can do the resource consent. We're developers. We just bought a site and we're building four air homes to develop this site. Anything you want as the consumer, we can do. We're very, very good at what we do. But this is discussing that the purpose of this webinar was essentially cost control for you, the purchaser. So a big majority of the purchasers for this product, they own a home, they have extra space in their yard. The government has made a change to policy where you don't need the building consent or the resource consent. And we can really, really cost effectively put this on your home. But if you have a beer site, if you have a farm, if you want to put three on or two or one, we would love to meet with you. We can do the consents. We can do everything. Uh, question, can, can a prefabricated home be craned over an existing house? Yes, this is very, very common. We just lifted a 35 tonne tilt panel 100 metres in the year on one of our major construction sites. That is the same weight as an ATR plane fully loaded flying from Christchurch to Hamilton with people. So... Very, very easy for us to do. We have fantastic relationships with crane providers uh, and we can bring in the expertise to put your ear home into very, very complicated situations. And it might not even be over a home. It might be up a steep bank. It might be all sorts of things. Um, cranes are very often the right thing for us to do for delivery and we'll bring in the right team and the right people to manage that process. So I'll jump on this one from Helen. Are there any rules around distance from the main dwelling? So I, I have looked at this quite specifically. There's, there's not yet. Um, and it's a bit of a funny one where they kind of say uh, reference, um, you know, reference the current zoning rules. But again, this whole thing's meant to ignore those. So I don't think they've worked out that detail yet. Um, so TBC, unfortunately, is the answer. It's not very helpful, I know. Are you taking these off? Can you take these off as we go so I don't get confused? Yeah. It's um, okay, so Helen has an interesting question. Um, can we use our own plumbers and electricians? I, I want to facilitate and enable your business. I'd love to help you. Probably no. Um, and the reason we say that is 
this is a Williams Corporation house. For the next 12 months, we have a 12-month defect period. For the next 10 years, we have a structural guarantee. But also forever, I know that I built that house, we built that house, and, and we have a warranty there. Uh, Do you think so? Do you think Helen is talking about on-site connections? Oh, possibly. But for the purpose of manufacturing within our facilities, yes. we've dealt with hundreds of trades we know our people who we trust. We've got our quality control systems and processes. So on-site manufacturing, uh, we would we would we would love to meet your trades and have a discussion. Maybe they could become Williams Corporation trades. So we would go through a review and selection process. You might know someone that's fantastic that we need to meet. So so I'm not saying no. I'm saying as a rule of thumb, no. But then for connection on your site, um, it's very very appropriate to have your plumber or electrician connect your ear home to your existing house or to whatever services are around it. Yeah. Okay, one from Chris Stevens. So have I understood the rules correctly where the granny flats can only be ordered once the rules are in place rather than advance? So no, and that's kind of what I was trying to allude to is that these rules are coming. Um, and so let's say they say, hey, look, these rules will be in place by mid next year, which is kind of what they said. What a lot of our customers are doing are getting the orders in now saying, well, let's start building January 1st. It'll be completed, you know, March-ish. And some of them are saying, look, just put on the property and once once, once those rules come into play, then that's great. Um, or you could time it so if it comes into play July 1st, it lands July 1st. So we'll work around you and what you want um, to make sure it happens to your timex. This is a really good question. Um, are there any requirements for, say, geotech, uh, stability, ground conditions, flood zones or bracing requirements, high wind zones, et cetera? Yes, so that's governed by the Building Act. So the house still needs to be built generally pursuant with the Building Act. And this is what Taylor pointed out really well. This is where providers that, and, and I'm not intending to knock the competition, that's not the purpose of the statement, but providers that don't have the right team that understand the Building Act, understand how to check your wind zones, how to check your snow load, how to check your um, sea, coastal erosion zone, how to check your bracing requirements, do your geotech report anyway, check your bearing capacity. Building is, is a very complicated art form. The New Zealand Construction Code does have nuance and technicalities, and it's very, very easy to make a mistake and to build a non-compliant product. Uh, and we we build lots of houses. We know what catches you out. We know what to look for. Uh, and we have the team that can nail this for you and build it perfectly as per the Building Act. So what I'd add to that, so um, I didn't add this because it seemed like a bit too much detail, but yes, we before you build, you are to request a PIM, a property information memorandum, and that would outline what wind zone you're in, what flood zone you're in, things like that. So again, something we do as part of the process and something we would continue to do. And as Matthew outlined, look, if you're in an extra high wind zone or if you're in a coastal erosion zone, then yes, we build to that zone. And you know, some people might not take to choose that step. Um, but again, this is just what we do every day and we'll continue to do. Uh, I like Caleb's question. Uh, can we expect your townhouses to be built this way in the future? We are very, very, very passionate about our prefabricated housing department, Ear Home, uh, because this opens up Williams Corporation to regional development. We have just purchased a site in Christchurch and we are manufacturing four Ear Homes to go on that site. Uh, once we have everything all perfect, we'll be buying sites all over New Zealand and doing nationwide delivery. So it's not going to be our townhouses. So our townhouses is a different product. Uh, this is a product that we put in city centres, targeting a very specific product to a very specific buyer. Uh, but we'll do a version of that product, which is Ear Home, uh, where we will do developments uh, nationally so we can provide housing for everyone across New Zealand. I, I awesome. want to do Quinn's question as well. Um, would you suggest removing a detached garage to put on a near home? So I just want to say a disclaimer. This is dangerously close to individualized financial advice. So I'm not answering your question. I'm pretending that this was an anonymous question on a forum and I'm giving a generic answer. So this doesn't constitute individualized financial advice. Please seek your own advice before making an investment decision. Uh, but I would sit down with a spreadsheet 
and I would say, what yield does that detached garage provide for the property? And it's going to be minor. It might increase your rent by $20, $30 a week. Then I would look at what cost is it to demolish that property and put an air home there? And then what is the yield? And I would review the property in its current form as a yield and the property with the air home as a yield. And I think that will answer the question that the most effective use of your capital and the best return on your investment is to demolish that garage and to put an air home there. But that's not individualized financial advice. Please have this discussion with a financial advisor. Dance before me. I would, would love that answer. I had yeah. all the talking points. Yeah. Um, hey, Helen, another one from you. So uh, regards to rural properties, do you need to tap into existing services or can you add separate sewage to, to the to service the minor dwelling? So again, this was part of the um, proposal. So what they said was, if there is reticulated sewage and there are um, public services that you can tap into, by all means do that. If there is not, then you can um, add your own septic systems and things like that. So pretty obvious stuff. You need to, the waste needs to go somewhere. If it exists, tap into that. If it doesn't, create your own solution. I really like this answer. If a development has a covenant that doesn't allow detached dwellings, does the granny flat rule still apply? My understanding, not a lawyer, uh, my understanding of law is contract law can supersede government law. So it would be reasonable to assume that the contract law will still hold. Uh, but there are cases where government policy supersedes all contract law. Uh, so it'll end up in this really weird piece where the developer or the, the covenant enforcer will say that their law is correct and the government will say our law supersedes all councils, all covenants, everything. And we probably need to see something go to high court and have case law to know. Um, I would lean towards no and respect the covenant, but it wouldn't surprise me if this went all the way to high court and got overturned. So someone's, that, someone's going to do it for sure. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think. To, if you want to do this dance with us just to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I, I, this will happen. This is, unchar this is uncharted territory. Yeah. Um, what you're probably better to do is work out whoever's in charge of the covenant, um, work out what it would cost you to go to court and just offer them a bribe to let you do what you want. Explain the other stuff. Payment for it. Yes. Um, I think we've got to the end of our questions. And, yeah, is that right? If anyone wants to ask any final questions, we're happy to sit here as long as you want. Um, there's a huge amount of you that have, have sat through an entire hour. Yeah, we haven't lost anyone either. Yeah. So if, right. if you do want anything, please just message it in that chat. We want to make sure we provide you as much value as possible. Um. Here we go. Will the, have we done this one? Will the granny flat proposal apply to separate already subdivided land block or will infill? Sorry, my brain can't read that. Will the granny flat proposed apply to a separate already subdivided block or will it only apply to infill residential? Oh, I think they're asking if it's already subdivided. Can so the, I, this is what I I believe they're asking. You have a site, you've mm. already subdivided it, but you haven't put a dwelling on the on the subdivided lot. Mm. Saying, well, nothing's been built there. Is this in a primary dwelling or a secondary dwelling? My gut feeling is council will interpret that as a primary dwelling. Yeah, and the reason being is because it can be sold separately. Uh, yeah. But we can still help this customer. We can just do the resource consent and the building consent for you. So, so don't think of a resource consent and a building consent as scary. I've done hundreds, if not thousands of these things. Uh, there are lots of customers where actually a resource consent or a building consent is probably better for you. You might be able to fit two air homes on the site. You might make more equity gain if we subdivide the title off. There's all sorts of things where you might need to break some setbacks or break some rule to get a better quality outcome on your site. So just because you can do this without a resource consent or a building consent, this still may not be the best outcome for you. Uh, so do absolutely make sure you, you consult with us uh, because and we can go through those different options. Well, look, that's bang on one hour. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much. I know you guys have so, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know you have so many options with what you can do with your evening and you chose to spend an hour with us learning about our prefabricated housing department. 
Uh, as you can see, we're very, very passionate about what we do. We would love to help you on your site with your property requirements. So please get in touch. And thank you for seeing what we have to say. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.